All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Don Gilmore, who is up in Toronto uh, in Canada. Hopefully it's nice and sunny there too, is it? <laughs> it is nice and sunny. Uh, unusual, but it's nice out there today. Oh, good, good, good. And, uh, and Don is a an author of multiple books and award-winning books too. But what we were going to focus on today is, especially for all of our sales people out there our awesome, in our audiences, this is fascinating. This We're going to talk about his book, Carload Ritchie, The Life and Times of Harold F. Ritchie, The World's Greatest sales, uh, Salesman. And that has um, uh, just published, right? Yeah, exactly. came out last week. Yeah, fantastic. So, so um, let's get straight into it, Don. You know, I always like to ask people, especially when it's a subject like this, is what was the genesis of the book? I went, where did you discover? Um, where did you discover Mr. Ritchie, and why did you decide that he was relevant for today? Well, the way I came to him because there's hardly any information on this guy, but his grandson is um, a Toronto guy who runs an investment firm, and. Um, we have a mutual friend and he mentioned that his grandfather was this fascinating character. So I took a look into what he had and um, uh, it turned out he was right. He, you know, he, when, when he died, Time Magazine uh, did say he was the world's greatest salesman. And, um, uh, and it turns out, I, I think that it was a fair claim. Mm -hmm. And and so um, just just looking at it here, um, it seems like he was quite a character in himself, quite a, an independent. Uh, you say he came from an island and he remained an island in, unto himself um, largely. Uh, explain that to me a little more. Well, you know, he was he's a 19th century, born in the 19th century, and um, he was born on an island about five hours north of Toronto, which is you know difficult to get to now and extremely mm -hmm. difficult to get to back then. So he was in and in a town of you know a hundred people, so really in the middle of nowhere. And um, for him at the time, you know, Toronto was a very kind of uh, it was very British and a, a had a kind of aristocracy, a sort of uh, corporate aristocracy mm -hmm. uh, that was difficult to break into, especially if you were from the middle of nowhere. And so he. Right. He kind of bypassed that whole world and and set up his own uh, uh, sales network and really didn't spend much time in Toronto or any time kind of socializing with those people. Yeah, which is which is kind of interesting, isn't it? Because that's kind of counter to probably counterintuitive to a lot of people that would have said, "Oh, you know, you need to get in with all these people. You need to be schmoozing and networking all the time." But uh, but uh, clearly, he saw he saw them as kind of a, a barrier or something to go around, and it's something that a lot of salespeople often come across today, not understanding where they should be and where they shouldn't be. Well, and I think, you know, also the, uh, Toronto was a very parochial society back mm -hmm. then. And, you know, the business didn't go much past the borders of the province or the country. And he was one of the first people, certainly in this country, to start thinking about selling, uh, you know, all over the world. So he ended up establishing offices in, you know, Australia, New Zealand, I mean, Ecuador, you know, all through South America, Central America. Um, and that, I think, is really what set him apart at the time, because there was very few uh, international networks. Uh, his, I think, was the first of, of, that was that extensive. Mm -hmm. And um, and what was it? What was it about his approach or his approach to selling that that made him so good and able to like build this whole network and almost empire? Well, you know, it, it's interesting. In the Time uh, Time Magazine obit they described him as. Uh, short and plump with a squeaky voice. So he didn't have, you know, a lot of kind of natural physical attributes. But one of the things he did do was he believed that he should go uh, himself to every one of the territories that he was selling into. So he would travel sometimes 200,000 miles in a year. And, you know, this would be in the 30s, late 20s mm -hmm. and 30s when it was you know, difficult to travel yeah. uh, and he would go to all these places and meet all these people and, and look at these markets and see what, you know, these people needed. 
so um so it sounds to me like you know he was he obviously was very big on understanding clearly like the markets understanding um the nuances of of maybe different markets different geographies that do uh, all of that and and it's funny because we we're at a stage now in in our evolution where people are kind of pulling back from doing those kind of things. They think, you know, a lot of stuff can be done online and virtually. So uh, it, it's an, it's interesting that we're kind of grappling with that now. Uh, but clearly, one of his big advantages was the, the, the firsthand research he did. Yeah. And also, you know, he was he was a kind of, you know, mini Warren Buffett in the sense that he realized what the companies that he was representing as a salesperson uh, he realized the potential of the best of them, and he ended up buying a bunch of those companies. And um, one of them was J.C. Eno, which was, you know, made Eno's fruit salts, which was a huge company. Uh, I think he paid more than ten million for it in the uh, like the turn of the century. That would have been a, like one hundred and fifty million in today's mm-hmm. currency. Um, but he also realized as those as those tariff barriers were going up in the thirties he would put factories into all these different countries, realizing, you know, then you would avoid the tariff barriers and you would also employ local people. And, there, you know, there was benefits to doing that. And um, so I think that that sort of global sense, um, which wasn't shared by many, certainly not many in this country at the time, really set him apart. Yeah, so that's fascinating. So he was really kind of contributing to the local um, the local economies of those uh, regions that he was going into, setting up factories, employing people. So not just selling his products, but actually also helping build up those communities. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, he did do a lot of, um, he sold a lot of what were at that time called patent medicines. And, you know, there was like Beecham had these pills, um uh, and you know uh, eno's fruit salts and there was a bunch of products like this um and those products ended up becoming the basis of the large pharmaceutical companies so you know glaxo for example used to be a, a milk additive for babies uh and it became evolved into glaxo smith klein but they glaxo smith klein recognizes Harold Ritchie as the sort of the grandfather uh, of their uh, corporate empire, because that's where he was headed. And he died at the age of 52. So he died before that came to fruition. But I think had he lived longer, he would have kind of wandered into the pharmaceutical world and and established, I think, a really significant or larger empire even uh, with that. Um, what were some of the challenges he faced initially when he was you know, getting started? And as you said, he came from this very remote, uh, remote place. Uh, you know, one of the things that happened, he he um, he was working out of Toronto, but he was selling all the way across the country. And of course, you know, it's a huge country and mm-hmm. not easy to travel, uh, you know, in, in 1905. And so he would go on these long, uh, you know, sales trips. And uh, like a second or third trip, he was gone for a couple of months. He got back and the, uh, he didn't get paid. They, um, uh, they stiffed him, basically. And, wow. you know, it was a kind of good news, bad news thing. So then he realized, you know, he really needed to be in business for himself. As long as he mm-hmm. was going to be representing others, this could, be, this could happen again. So it did nudge him uh, out on his own. But he did have some, I think, very difficult times at first. And and at first, um, then uh, you said later on, like he bought companies. At first, though, it sounds like he he was an independent. Was he he represented certain products from different companies? Was that how he operated? Yeah, and I think he had a you know he had a mix. He started with uh, you know mostly kind of groceries, and you know because his father had a uh, a little general store that sold groceries in uh, up in Manitoulin Island. So he knew that world. And so he he always kept those lines as a kind of, um, you know, it would be a steady income no matter what, you know, anything else did in terms of uh, how other products were performing. You're always going to have the, the grocery sales. So he kept that throughout his life. But then he kind of got more adventurous and he got into a lot of beauty products uh, in the 20s when that was starting to be a big thing. And um, uh, he... Um, uh, and again, you know, jumping into the pharmaceutical world. 
uh, early on. Yeah, and it's interesting what you said earlier about the time describing him as you know short and plump with a squeaky voice. And remember now, that's Time's description, not mine. Yeah. It's Time's description. Uh, and so obviously, uh, that probably runs contrary to a lot of people's perceptions, I would say wrong perceptions about what a salesperson looks like and sounds like and all of that. Um, what was what was his, what was special about him that he was able to, I mean, what was his technique or what was his approach or what was his personality like that would have made him such a, a, a good salesperson? Well, I think one of the things was he was genuinely interested in all the places he went to. So he was a, a great listener and, and wanted to hear about every town and area and village. Um, but the other thing was, I think he always was thinking long term. So he would never kind of go into a territory and try and, you know, dump stuff that, you know, no one could sell. Uh, mm -hmm. And because he, he knew he'd be back the next year and the year after that. So he forged those relationships early on and maintained them. Um, and he essentially hired people in his own image. You know, he was a, you know, he didn't drink, he didn't smoke. He was a, um, he was a very kind of straight laced guy and he tended to hire young men that were in that mold. Yeah, that's a, that's that's really interesting, and it, and again, something that resonates and and uh, and continues to this day is obviously in sales. If you are genuinely interested, genuinely curious, uh, good listener, ask good questions, but be a really good listener. But that genuine interest, I think, is the critical piece, and um, and as you say. Obviously, everywhere he went, he really wanted to know about it. So he, he wasn't he wasn't passing through so much as he was looking to build long term relationships. And I think that's something that, you know, that's a mistake that people often make is not not taking the longer view, which clearly he did. Yeah, and I think um, you know the only uh, I don't know if it was a mistake he made, but um, because he was so integral and a kind of a micromanager to his own company which was, had become vast by the time he, he died. Um, once he died, you know, it really was difficult to sustain the company without him because his, those connections and his, you know, personal relationships with all those mm -hmm. people really was uh, the sustaining factor. So it, in a, after a few years, his, um, his widow ended up selling the company. Um, so it sort of kind of quietly dissipated over the next decade um, and got, you know, bought up by these larger right. uh, concerns. Yeah, no, that's a, that's, that's really interesting as well. You know, that fact that it, it, a lot of it depended on him. So that's always also a good lesson for people is, you know, you need to have the relationship needs to be able to sustain beyond, uh, beyond one person. Um, and tell me, how was he, how was he perceived at the time? Like how, how, how did the business world perceive him at the time? Well, that's the th thing, you know, because he traveled so much, um, he was almost, he was rarely in Toronto, even though he had a big family and he mm -hmm. was a kind of dedicated family man. So there's little record of him anywhere. He was a kind of, um, you know, the ghost. You, uh, once he bought the JC Eno company in London, um, you see a lot more coverage in the British papers about him. Um, and there's more about him in New York than there was in Toronto. But he, um, uh, you know, I think he was uh, viewed as a real outsider, in certainly in Toronto. Um, I think in New York and London, he was sort of more warmly embraced. And I, I think, uh, although uh, in London, you know, back then when he bought the Eno company, uh, England was still in a very kind of, you know, colonial minded mm -hmm. uh, mindset as far as sales you know the the um minister of trade was saying well there's no need to trade with all these other countries we can just simply trade with the colonies that everyone you know <laughs> speaks the language it's much easier why bother going you know off to bora bora um <laughs> and and uh richie was had the opposite view yeah uh, well we know inter intercolonial uh in uh, intracolonial um Commerce uh, was definitely loaded in favor of one of those parties, so yeah. <laughs> probably less less fair trade. Um, so, what is the where does the carload Richie come from? Uh, apparently, when uh, his first sales trip, and he would have been you know twenty years old or so, um, he went out west and 
uh, I guess they ended up selling carloads. Of, he ended up selling carloads of, uh, you know, dry goods and groceries. And someone gave him that nickname and it stuck. Oh, that's 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 fascinating. Um, what is what what is his legacy, or what is his legacy been, or is is this something that you're hoping, like with your book, you can at least kind of rejuvenate some interest in him? What what is his legacy? Do you think? Well, I think the the legacy was, uh, you know, here you you could grow up in the middle of nowhere, and yet you could, you know, embrace the world um, in the way that he did, uh, which was, you know so difficult back then um and i think just that sense of you know understanding how how big the world is and and how you can kind of inhabit it um regardless of where you come from i think that was the 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 big legacy because it's still i mean it's much different now but you know you still do have a kind of uh cabal of sorts of, of certain kind of corporate types here in toronto um yeah yeah no I, w- I would say that's true i'd say that's probably true in most places uh and you know so the outsiders are always are always good for uh for mixing things mixing things up a little um and, and what do you think are some of the you know apart from the fact he was he was very curious he listened a lot what are some of the other things that you think people could take away from him and apply to today well i think that the other thing was he understood where society was going because he he ended up buying um, companies that were selling beauty products. So he, he ended up owning, you know, Brill Cream, the old that hair <laughs> product that you don't see anymore. But um, there, there was all kinds of other um, beauty products, and he could see that, especially after World War One, there was you know more money, and people were more interested in how they looked, and also the patent medicine. He could see that there was this, you know, everyone was suffering from something, and um, that world he could see was going to grow and grow, which of course, you know, now it's extraordinarily mm-hmm. large. And so I think that sense of looking forward and seeing, you know, he knew what people needed, which was all the groceries and things which he sold, but he also really understood what they wanted. And I think that's where, you know, the bulk of his fortune was made. Well, that's really interesting. And you said he owned the, he owned Brill Cream. Yeah, it, Brill Cream and there was uh, it was called Pompeii. It was a beauty company that right. made all kinds of different creams, and I, I think he owned three different companies that made beauty products. Wow! So at least then I have some connection to him then, because back in our back in my youth, you know, we used to use Brill Cream sometimes. Oh yeah! I don't even know if it, I don't know if it still exists anymore, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, remember that there was an ad. It was, it was a little dab will do you. That's what the ad was back uh, in North America <laughs> back in the sixties. Yeah, I think we probably overused it back in those days. I think you could probably, you know, fry your dinner in our hair. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just one last one last question. Um, uh, one last question, Don. So why do you think it's important? As I said, I, I, I love history. Why do you think it's important for us to remember people like this and, and learn from them? Well, I think, um, you know, we have uh, people like this who, especially someone like this who was an obscure figure because mm-hmm. he, he liked to stay out of the papers. He didn't like his name in the papers and he didn't live in the actual city of Toronto. He lived sort of just outside it and um, had a huge country home that he stayed at most of the time. So he was sort of on the periphery uh, of everything. But I think, um, you know, right now, I think that the way he viewed the world um, I, I think is something we can look at now as being of value because, you know, we're in that mode again, where there's, you know, tariff barriers are going up and uh, depending on how the midterm elections go in the States um, uh, and how the, the election goes in two years, um, there could be uh, even more barriers going up in the States and, and more kind of nationalism and parochialism and I think, you know, the, he was a force against those things. And I, uh, and I think, you know, something to look at now. No, absolutely. Well, this is this has been fascinating, Don. I'm, I mean, I highly recommend people to check out the book, Carload Ritchie, uh, the world, uh, world's greatest, Harold F. Ritchie, world's greatest salesman. Um, so all of Don's information and a link to the book will be below this video. But before we go, Don, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. 
Well, I'm a, a journalist and novelist living in uh, Toronto, um, and um, and also write children's books as well. So, um, uh, kind of a, a magazine writing, book writing, and uh, every once in a while, a children's book as a kind of uh, antidote to all the rest. Yeah. Well, listen, I would highly, uh, uh, highly recommend you check it out. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm a big consumer of history and I do believe that, uh, that old, uh, old saying, you know, if those who, uh, don't learn history or, or, uh, learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And I think, unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of that in the world today. People are not learning the lessons of history. Uh, and, uh, so I, I commend you on the book. So thank you, Don. Thank you for watching and listening. I'll see you all again soon. Thank you.